Amen. We want to say good morning to everyone and God bless you all. And uh, we thank God that you all have joined us. Uh, of course, we thank God for those that are listening in uh, live over the phone or watching us live over the Internet or, you know, watching us uh, by archive on YouTube. Also, those who are watching us on TV, we thank God for you as well. And also, we want to thank God for those who are sitting here presently with us. We pray that uh, what the Lord has to say today will be a <clears throat> will be a blessing to you. Uh, amen. Uh, amen. We just thank God for just this opportunity to be able to come together and uh, share his word and share in the things that he has for us to uh, to look into. And it's always a blessing, I think, to be able to hear what God has to say to us uh, on this day and in, in, in this in this hour and the times that we are living in. This is one of those messages that I don't quite understand why the Lord is having me to share this, uh, but we're going to share it. Amen. One thing uh, we just want to let everyone know that God has blessed uh, this ministry with two uh, industrial sized copiers. Uh, don't you know. And so we're thankful for that. Thankful, you know, for that, uh, that they're both operating. And uh, we look forward, I guess, to bringing you some reading material. <laughs> I, I imagine that's what it's for. And I uh, also uh, want to take this time out, uh, of course, to thank uh, a dear friend and brother of mine, Brother uh, Warren Williams, uh, who, uh, of course, those are some heavy, heavy, very heavy copiers. And uh, <clears throat> had went and got the first one uh, before he, uh, while he was still at work, and so uh, had the uh, uh, had the dolly outside. And as he was uh, coming in from work, he saw the dolly outside, and he asked me. Uh, he saw. He told me that he saw the dolly sitting out there, and was wondering if I needed help with anything. And uh, that really, really uh, blessed me, and I'd like to let him know that, that, uh, you know, after working a, a, a hard shift at his job, that he came on and, and uh, helped me to, to move the copier, you know, and went with me, which I, I know how that is. You, you go to work, and when you come home, you just want to come home and relax. But uh, I thank God for him uh, helping me to, to move that, that copier, and uh, it was pretty heavy, I'll tell you that. Right now, there's no way I could have did that by myself. And so I just thank God for that. And I believe it's important that we uh, let people know uh, that we that we appreciate them while they're here. Uh, instead of waiting until we see them stretched out somewhere uh, to tell them, you know, we let them know while they're here that we appreciate them. So we just just uh, as the old people say, giving him his flowers. <laughs> Amen. So. Uh, uh, this morning, uh, <clears throat> well, yesterday I was praying about what uh, what the Lord wanted me to say uh, to His people, uh, of course, as we usually do, and uh, it just, something just kept coming to my mind to to speak on. Uh, but I thought, well, Lord, I you know I, I don't know if this is you or not, so I just kept praying. And, and so last night I had a dream that I was sitting uh, at my desk, flipping through the Bible was uh, wanted to go to the book of Acts uh, in there uh, while I was sitting there and flipping to the pages and I noticed that the pages in my Bible were bent, you know, had been folded for some reason. And so it seemed like I just couldn't get to the book of Acts even though I knew that that's where I wanted to go. And while I was flipping, uh, the Lord came in and he put his, you know, came up behind me and put his uh, hand around over to my shoulder there and he said, you go to one of Psalms 105 and 5. And so if you have your Bibles, let's go there. To Psalms, uh, the 105th number of Psalms, uh, and to the 5th verse. Amen. And this was just confirmation, really, on what, it, what, he, what I felt led to share yesterday. Uh, but again, I, I wasn't sure, so I was praying and asking the Lord. And so he answered my prayer last night. All right, the 105th. Uh, number of Psalms. We're going to read verse 5. It says, Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. 
So, again, we'll read that again. It says, remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. <clears throat> now, let, let me just say this. I think it's important that today uh, th that we understand that God is still operating the way he did in the Bible days. And I think that it's important that people understand that God is not just sitting back and, you know, you just live in your life and you just happen to find yourself in this situation and in that situation. But God, he he orchestrates these things. And if we will learn to acknowledge him and to look to him, we'll see just how he's putting it all together. You know, he'll give us an inside look at, at, at how he puts it together. And what it will do, it will keep us from getting bitter when things come our way that we don't necessarily like or that we, you know, that we, we think, well, I deserve better or I had something else in mind for my life. It will keep us from getting bitter if, if we will look at it this way, that God is the one that's the author of our lives. He's the one that orchestrate our lives. He's the one that allows us to get put in certain situations and it will help us to appreciate uh, what it is that he's that he's doing in our lives, even when we don't understand it. Bottom line is we just have to trust God. Amen. You see, we just have to trust him. In fact, let's go there to the eighth chapter of Romans. Let's take a look at this scripture that so many people uh, <laughs> misinterpret. Uh, the eighth chapter of Romans. Uh, let's see here. And verse twenty eight. Well, let's back up verse 26, and that will give us a broader picture uh, of what this is, what this is concerning. And uh, my prayer is that you all will be patient. We're going to take our time. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get through this, uh, but we're going to take our time with it. And we're going to uh, just, I think, we're going to say some things that's going, you know, that, that you're going to be a little surprised at this morning. All right, to start reading at verse 26, the eighth chapter of Romans. It says, Likewise... The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Now that tells us something there. Mm -hmm. We don't know what we should pray for as we ought. What does that mean? According to God's will. You know, when we get on our knees to pray before God, God doesn't want us giving him a, a whole laundry list of things that we want him to do for us. This Bible says that we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. In other words... You know, if you don't know God's perfect will for your life already, you ask him for his perfect will so that you'll know how to pray. Amen. You see that? I'm going to tell you why. Because sometimes you'll be praying for things and you won't have any idea that you're really praying against God's will. Mm -hmm. Come on, man. You see? Come on. So now, let's keep reading here. It says, but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to what? The will of God. The will of God. Not your own will. Lord, I want to go to college. Uh, Lord, I want a brand new car. That's your will. It might not be God's will, you see. And we better know that when we when we submit ourselves to God, that's exactly what we're doing. We're saying, God, I give up my own life for yours. Amen. Jesus tells us that for us to follow him, we have to take up our cross. You see, we have to take up our cross. We have to lay down our lives. And that don't mean literally dying, even though it may come to that at some point. But he's talking about laying down your life. He means your own ambitions, everything that you dreamed of your, seeing yourself do, lay that down for his sake. You see? Amen. That, now, that's what that means. Now, you can't be his disciple until you're willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Why? Because God will want you in one place and you'll be in another place and, and still going to church thinking that you're following God. And God is saying, wait a minute, what you doing way over here? I want you over there. Amen. You see? And so God's will is his will. He don't adjust his will to fit your will, to fit your will. His will is his will. Now, either you're in, a, in it or out of it. There's no in-betweens. Okay, Lord, I, I understand, you know, like, for instance, when God told, when the Lord told them to go, uh, go to the Jerusalem where the Holy Spirit would he, he wait to wait on the promise, when he told them to go to a certain place and wait on the promise, he meant that. 
And they didn't change their minds and say, well, we know God said for us to go here, but we're going to go over there. They had to be where the spirit was going to fall at for them to receive it. You see? And so if, if you want to if you want to see uh, the real true majesty of God operating in your life, the power of, of his majesty operating in your life, you have to be where he's assigned you to be. Now, this was ordained before you were formed, before you were born. He had ordained for you to be wherever you are in his will, you see. And so what happens is we get out of his will. We get our own. We get our own ambitions. We we, we think of things that we want to do. As you've heard me say before, I had in my mind, I'm going to be a lawyer. But God said, no, you're not going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a, a doctor of this word. And, and that's what you're going to, you know, you're going to bring to the people is my word, you see. And so we have to lay down our own lives uh, if we're going to do anything for God, you see. Now, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to whose purpose? God. His purpose, mm -hmm. not not your will. You see, according now, look at what that says there. And, we, and this is something that we really want to bring out this morning. We know that all things work together for good to them. It, that doesn't say all things works out, you know, so that you could feel good and so that you don't ever go through anything. Amen. And that's what people take that scripture. They when they get finished doctrine on it, that's what it comes out, meaning. Hey, nothing's ever going to happen to me because all things work out for the good. It works out for the good. Let me make this clear. God is less concerned with you being comfortable in your flesh and he's less concerned with you feeling good than he is about his perfect will. You see, and so let me say this. Sometimes God's perfect will is not comfortable for us, depending on how far we've gone, gone out the way with our own will. You see, but it, what it's talking about is that it works out. Out means you're outside of the situation. In other words, when you get on the other side, you'll be able to look back and say, OK, now I understand why I had to go through this. But as long as you're going through it, you just like, well, wait a minute, God, where are you? I thought it all worked out for the good. Wow. No, <laughs> God said it is. You just have to trust me. That's all. You just have to trust me. And so that's what God wants to do now. Uh, the thing that the Lord wanted me to share with you this morning was uh, <clears throat> my testimony of, of how I was called into the ministry and how he put me into the ministry. Now, let me say this. Some of you, you have heard how I was called, but you haven't heard what, how I was put into the ministry, you see. And I tell you, it wasn't a comfortable journey at all you see and so we're going to backtrack and we're going to go over just a few things that you may have heard before just for the purpose of those who may not have heard it uh my my mother and father uh they got married in 1969 september 20th 1969 and my mother right away as most women did in those days wanted to have children uh but for some reason uh her womb was shut and uh she 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 read in the bible about Hannah, uh, who was who was uh, Samuel's mother and how she had wanted a child and the Lord had spoke to her uh, uh, and she began to pray. And, and she told the Lord, if you will, um, she told the Lord, if, if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. And so that became my mother's prayer. If you will give me a son, I will give him back to you. You see. And so and, and that's what and that's what took place. That's exactly what took place five years later, some five years and uh, two and a half months after uh, my mother and father were married, uh, I was born, you see. And so, uh, as you've heard me say before, that my mother was sure that she was going to have a son, so sure that she went out and bought boy clothes before I was born. And some of the people, of course, they ridiculed her. How you know it's going to be a boy? Maybe you should buy some neutral clothes, some yellow or something like that, that both, you know, that males and females can wear. And my mother's stand was, I prayed for a son and the Lord, you know, allowed me to get pregnant. And so she, he's going to give me a son. This is going to be a son. Not only that, he's going to be a preacher. He's going to he's going to speak God's word. And so that's what took place. I was born on December 6, 1974. You see. December 6, 1974. And so uh, uh, 
ever since I can remember, and people ask me that, and so I just tell them, ever since I remember, I, I can remember, I knew that I was called to preach. I knew that before I knew my name. And before I could, before I could talk, my mother tells me, and I can remember doing this, I used to take a spoon and I would walk up and down the hallway in our house preaching. And this is before I could form my words, you see. And uh, in fact, that was my first nickname, was the little preacher. That's what people called me. My mother used to dress me up in suit and tie, and I had my little Bible, and, and you know, and so that was my nickname, the little preacher. And so I knew that I was called to preach, you know, ever since I can remember being, ever since I can remember existing, you see. Now, at the age of four or five, uh, I remember being in the tub, and uh, my, mother, my father was laid out on the floor there in the uh, living room as he, for some reason, he liked laying on the floor. You know, I remember him laying uh, on that floor more than I remember him sitting in a chair. And he was laid on the floor, and my mother called me out of the tub. And uh, so I got out of the tub, and she asked me to pray for my daddy. Now, this was, I guess I was about four years old. This was before I was ashamed of being naked. And I, because I can remember just getting straight out of the tub, not being ashamed, and just walking up to him and laying hands on him on, in his chest area to pray for him. And so, uh, uh, in between that, and, uh, um, you know, a few years uh, passed, and my mother would get me all these speaking engagements in different churches. You know, I would go to this church and would have to speak or just say a little something concerning some part of the Bible. And, and so it went on like that until I got grown, really, you see. But at the age of uh, when I was 11 years old, uh, I went into a coma. And uh, I, at the time, I was in the seventh grade, and I was in the choir, the seventh grade choir, uh, the junior high school choir, I should say. And um, I um, went into a coma, I think it was in September, October of uh, 1986. And I stayed in that coma for a week. And uh, when I came out of that coma, uh, of course, I'm looking around, and uh, I don't know what's going on, you see. I don't know why I'm laying up in the hospital. Um, but um, all of a sudden, I had a, a big urge to study the Bible, to just study the Word, you see. And so uh, on the way home, um, and just, I'm just trying to make this all as short as I can, you see, because we got a lot to go through. But on the way home, uh, when we pulled up to the house uh, after I got out of the hospital, uh, before I could get out of the car, my mother handed me a, a box that was gift wrapped. And I opened it up. And... Uh, uh, when I opened it up, there it was. It was a little black Bible with my name on it, you see. And uh, what had happened, I was told that when I was in that coma, that the people, uh, you know, some of my choir mates, they had raised money, uh, you know, took up a little offering. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was like $25 or something. And that's what my mother went and bought for me, a little Bible, black Bible. In fact, I still have that Bible. Amen. It's on the lock and key, you see. And so I, I began to study that Bible. The following year, in July of 1987, uh, the fear of death came over me where I was sure that I was going to uh, die in my sleep, that I wasn't going to wake up the next morning. And so I began to pray, and I asked the Lord, Lord, if, I'll do whatever you tell me to do if you'll let me wake up the next day, if you'll let me wake up tomorrow. And so that night I had a dream that I was standing in the pulpit, and I was about to preach, and uh, before I could open my mouth, the Lord spoke to me and said, don't be afraid. And I woke up and sat up in the bed, happy to be alive. And he continued to say, because I'm with you. And, and so then I, you know, that was my calling. And so then I went. And, OK. And besides that, when I was little, of course, we played church. You know, all little neighborhood children would come, come to the house. And uh, that's what we would do. Play church. The girls would bring their tambourines and wear their mama's big hats and, and you know, uh, it just it looked like church. I just put it that way. We had deacons and everything. <laughs> and so all of this was just God confirming his calling. I would be standing in the mirror as a little boy, you know, just, you know, getting myself ready, maybe brushing my teeth or washing my face. And just all of a sudden I would find myself preaching for no particular reason, just preaching in the mirror. And so it was clear that there was a calling on my life. And so at the age of 12, God told me to preach. And he didn't say wait. He said preach, you see. And so um, I, I told some people what the Lord had spoke to me. 
and had got discouraged from doing it, and so I didn't do it from the age of 12 until 20. Now, let me say this. When you get outside of God's will, uh, I mean purposely outside of his will, you're not going to make good decisions. And when you're outside of what God has called you to do, you see, it's, it's not it's meant for your life to go well. Many people wonder why they've had a hard life. It's because you don't have any life outside of God to begin with. Jesus Christ said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. You see, so no matter how much of a good time you think you're having, you're really miserable. And that's the pre reason why so many people try to find happiness. They try to find it in vacation. They try to find it in clubs and drinking and doing all of these things. They're looking for stuff that will only bring temporal satisfaction. You see, and, and so uh, from that point, I became really, really rebellious. Let me tell you something. When you when you turn your back on God uh, and when you don't do what God called you to do, uh, you're going to be rebellious. Number one, you're rebellious against God. And then it just trickles downhill after that. You become rebellious against authority, any kind of authority. And I was the worst of the worst. I just put it that way. You see, uh, couldn't nobody tell me anything. I, I was a mean, mad somebody. All the time, you see, I didn't want anybody to bother me or anything like that. I just wanted to, I just, you know, just really too mean to live, really, you see. And so I just became rebellious, just became rebellious. By that time, of course, uh, my, my father had passed away, so my mother was raising us. And you know how it is with, 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 with mothers and their teenage sons. Uh, the son get just a couple of inches taller than mama, and mama can't tell him anything, you see. And so that's the way I was. Couldn't tell me anything. I was getting in all kind of trouble and, and just doing things I, I shouldn't have been doing, you see. And so uh, it, just, it just got worse. I was just mad at the world. And my real problem was I wasn't submitted to God. Now, let me say this. When you're living on the outside of God's purpose for you, you don't have any purpose. And so you wander around trying to figure out what is it that's going to make me happy. Uh, you wonder, why am I so angry? You know why? Because you're not doing what you were created to do. Hmm. Now, when you find what your purpose is, why God placed you on this earth, then, then you, you'll be a happy somebody. But when you're just wandering around and you're not even aware that you have a purpose, you're in trouble. Because the devil will give you all kind of purposes. He'll give you all kind of things to do. You see? And so it's important that you find what God's will is for your life. If, if you don't, you're in trouble. You're just wandering around, just wandering around, just not knowing what, what to do next. What am I, you know? And so I became rebellious and find myself uh, having run-ins with the law and, and things like that. And so at the age of 17, I graduated from high school and I did the same thing Jonah did. Uh, I joined the Navy and got on a boat, ran for my calling, you see. And listen, it, it, joining the military is the wrong thing to do. Uh, when you don't respect authority and you're going to have to bow down to somebody's authority, you see. And so I, I joined the military with good intentions. Well, maybe they'll shake me up. You know, maybe they'll get me. Listen, when you don't bow down to God and his word, there's not one other human in this world that's going to get you in shape. You see, not one. You, you won't bow down to any other human or any other institution or whatever it may be until you learn how to bow down to your creator. You see. And so uh, I joined the military at the age of 17, and I thought, well, I'm going to spend 20, I'm going to do, you know, a whole 20 years or more until I retire, and that's going to be my, my setup, you see. I'll be set for life. I'll retire from the military, and that'll be good, you see. I uh, joined the military, and uh, uh, less than six months after I joined, uh, my grandfather passed away, who was my last living biological father, you see. And I bought a ticket, I think it was around $520, to fly from Virginia Beach uh, to New Orleans for his funeral and uh, didn't know the process for doing all of that. I'm just thinking, well, when I tell the military, this is my grandfather, they're going to let me go, you see. And, but I didn't know that I was going to have to get it all approved because he wasn't an immediate family member. And so I had to go before a board. To prove this is my last living grandfather, that he had something to do with raising me. And about time I got finished proving that, my plane had took off. So that didn't set well with me. And so then I pick orders 
you know, uh, to go to get stationed in San Diego and thinking that I'm going to, you know, go over to San Diego and it, life is going to be fun. I'm going to be spending time on the beach and just living it up and having a good, nice time. And uh, I, I pick artists to go and thinking that I'm going to drive out the next morning to San Diego from one side of the U.S. to the other, of course. And the next morning they came and told me, oh, no, your, your ship is not in San Diego. It's in, uh, in Somalia. So we're going to buy you a plane ticket to fly you from here up to Dover Air Force Base. And, you know, never mind that you have a car or anything like that. You, you, we don't care about uh, any of that. This is where you're flying out of, you see. And so that's what happened. I flew out of Do Dover Air Force Base. I got on that plane on the 28th of uh, April, uh, of March, I'm sorry. And I didn't get off of that plane until the 31st of March. I, I was in the air for so long, I, I just lost sight that I was even, even on a plane. It just felt like I was in somebody's house somewhere. There were no windows or anything like that, you see. And uh, got to, a after three days of being on a plane, uh, I got to Mogadishu, Somalia, and, you know, went to sleep. I got there, I guess, about 3 or 4 in the morning, went to sleep. Was awakened at about six o'clock in the morning with an officer bringing me and two other uh, guys in the military some breakfast, and uh, said, "They look like y'all plane out there." Uh, except it wasn't. Found out that our plane was actually in in uh, Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia. So they said, "Well, we don't have another plane coming in for another month. So here's a machine gun, an M60. This is how you take it apart. This is how you put it back together." Every morning when you every uh, morning when you wake up, we're going to give you a password because of all of the intruders that we have that try to come in. Uh, you have to know that password when you're asked on the spot. Uh, either they could shoot you on the spot, or, or they could bring you to the captain and and and, and let you prove that you that you are uh, in the military here. Oh, and by the way, here go some pills because it's got malaria and everything else over here. So here go a bunch of pills for you to take. You see, I, I was over there for two months and I slept with my fingers in my ears because our camp was right by the runway where these jets were coming in at. And I'm saying they were so close that you could feel the heat off of the back of these jets. And so these weren't just regular jets. These were steam powered jets. In other words, they were ran by steam from water, which makes them, made them louder. Just like, you know, a steam pot goes off there for tea and, and things like that. That's how those things sounded all the time. And so I got tired of being awakened out of my sleep, you know, being scared out of my sleep when those things would just fly in like that, that I just learned to sleep with my fingers in my ears, you see. So over there for two months, and I, and I know right away, I'm Jonah. I'm not having a good time like I thought I was. Where's the beach? Where's all the fun and sun? You know, this wasn't supposed to end up like this. And, and the Lord let me know, you know, it ain't, it's not going to go well when you're out of my will. I told you to preach. You see, I ain't tell you anything about joining the Navy. What's that got to do with preaching? And, and so, <clears throat> fast forward, eventually made it to Bahrain uh, and went around the world like that uh, one and a half times and finally made it to San Diego, my duty station, you see. Uh, I, I, I made friends with a guy who was a Muslim, this, this black guy. He and I became friends, and I was the type, you know, I, I didn't discriminate against anybody. If you were my friend, you were my friend. He and I, when we talked, we just talked about Bible stuff, you know, and he would tell me the differences of what they believed, and I was always trying to convince him that Jesus Christ was Lord and, and things like that. And so the upper people, the officers in the Navy, they saw me conversing with him, and immediately I became their enemy. And, and the reason why, it was because this guy, they didn't like him because the black Muslims believed, the, the sect that he was belonged to, they believed that all white people were devils. And so he didn't mind telling them that. The only difference was he was high up in rank. And so they couldn't bother him. But see, they saw me talking to him and they thought, well, you must believe the same thing. So I became a target. In fact, I was told, you know, by an officer that he was going to mess me over every chance he got. And so, you know, of course, and that's exactly what happened. I, I got stationed somewhere else on the same base, and uh, all of a sudden, my financial records came up missing some kind of way. So I didn't get paid for a year, you see. 
And so I'm having to do my job in the Navy and go work somewhere else so that I could pay bills. <laughs> Again, uh, where is God in all of this? Just let me have my own way. I didn't tell you to join the Navy. That was you. I told you to preach. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> so uh, uh, just, just, you know, ran into a lot of things in the military. At some point, uh, I, I got, I, I called a stepfather of mine, uh, and, uh, talked to his fiance. He was, you know, him and my mother had divorced. So I talked to his fiance at the time and she said that he didn't have but a few months to live. And so, uh, I, I put in a request to go down and, and visit with him before, uh, you know, he passed away and they denied it. I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll bite that one. And then I got another call saying that my brother uh, was, was uh, getting married, you see. So I, I put in a request to go and be a part of that wedding, and that was denied. So, of course, you, you see what's all taking place. So, you know me, I didn't respect authority. I can care less. I, I'll just go without your permission. And so that's what I did. Went down there and still didn't get to get to go to the to the to the wedding. And so, you know, my thinking was I'll go down there. I'll be missing for a couple of days. Oh, I'll get a slap on the wrist when I get back, you know, from the Navy. They ain't they're not going to do much. So I called a friend of mine back there and he said, man, they've already court martialed you and they've sentenced you already to six months in the brig. So I said, OK, I'll just stay going until I feel like getting back there. <laughs> and they've already sent us me anyway. What else are they going to do? You see? And so that's exactly what I did. I stayed down there. Uh, my stepdaddy uh, died, uh, you know, in November. And in my mind, I'll just go back, you know, after we bury him. And then, you know, was talking to somebody and they said, well, you might as well go ahead and stay to Christmas now. I was like, you sure right. They, and I'm not getting in time, you know, so I'll just go, go ahead and stay, you know. <laughs> so... <laughs> Now, in, in all of this time, uh, I, you know, I'm standing at my grandmother's house taking care of her, and I'm working at, at, at Burger King, you see. And uh, so everything is fine, just, you know, working at Burger King. And uh, for Christmas, we were going over to my aunt's house, and, and another auntie of mine, I was going to be riding with her. And so I checked the tire before we left, her spare tire, and it was... It was uh, it was okay. Now, let me, let me back up just a little bit. Uh, in all of this, again, I got all of this anger in me because of things that have taken place. Uh, my, my mother is, is married to a preacher who I don't like at all at this time, you see. You see. Now, let me just say this. When you're outside of God's will, you're outside of his will, and, and you will have things on the inside of you that you don't quite understand, you see, and, and really the devil, you're a prime suspect for the devil to use you to upset other people. And so I just had it in for my mother and my stepdaddy. And so I wasn't going to physically fight my mother at all, uh, but I didn't mind telling my stepdaddy uh, to have his running shoes on when I get to town, you see. And so I was just talking to all just... You know, I, I mean, just just full of anger. I don't know how else to explain it. Just full of anger, talking noise, telling my stepdaddy what I was going to do to him the next time I saw him, and, and all of these things. And something weird happened. Uh, w within a few days of that conversation, I, I got something in the mail, a big package from him and my mother. And I opened that package up, and there was a box full of clothes for me. And, you know, a, a love will break down hate, you see. Uh, you can be full of hatred when you want to. Love will always overcome that. Amen. Love will always overcome it, you see. And so then I begin to think, I can't, what do I look like fighting old people? And I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And these people have sent me some clothes. I need to get right. And that was my thought. I need to get right. So I begin to study the Bible again, you see. And I'm going to tell you something that helped me and I pray that, that it will help you. And it was something that taught me a valuable lesson. My grandmother knew what kind of trouble I was in with the military. Uh, and she knew that I was really no good. You know, and what I mean is that I was just, just out, just doing whatever I was, thought I was big and bad enough to do. You know, I, I wasn't trying to live for the Lord at all. I was being good to her, you know, cooking her breakfast every morning and 
cooking dinner and clean, keeping the house clean and things like that. Uh, but she knew, I really understood that I, I needed to submit my life to the Lord. And so, you know, after getting this package in the mail, it completely turned my life around. Just that one act of love turned my whole life around to where I knew I need to, I need to get right. I need to do what God have called me to do. So I began to study the word. And just one day I, I, I came over. Uh, my grandmother was sitting in the living room. And I sat in a chair across from her. And I said, um, Momo, I said, uh, you want to have Bible study? Uh, no, I asked her if she was going to Bible study. And uh, she said, no, we're not having Bible study tonight. You know, I don't know why they didn't have it that night. And so I said, well, Momo, do you want to you wanna have Bible study with me then? And she said, yeah. She, I said, you mind if I teach it? She said, no, I don't mind. And so I've been studying the word and uh, the Lord had showed me in the Bible where uh, uh, John the Baptist, he had the same spirit on him that Elijah had. And so we studied on that. And I asked, her, I said, Momo, did you know that? And she said, no, I didn't. I didn't know that. And so we just talked about that. And she let me teach Bible study. Now, this was just a few days uh, after hearing me outside ready to fight and cuss and, ev and everything like that. Now, I want you to, uh, this is what I want you to know. She gave me room to be what God called me to be. Everybody understand? Amen. Even when it wasn't really manifesting, she gave me room to walk in my calling. You see, she didn't say like many of us would say, well, you were just outside cussing and fighting. What, what you, why, am I, why should I hear you uh, uh, teach Bible study? She let, she opened that door for me and I walked through it, you see. She opened that door for me and I walked through it. And so from there, uh, of course, I'm still AWOL from the Navy. Uh, now we're fast forwarding. Well, I'm, I'm riding to another part of Louisiana with my auntie. And, uh, you know, it's at nighttime. I had worked all day. And, uh, in fact, I think she picked me up from work. And it's a few of us in the, in the vehicle there. And at, I'm in the back seat sleep because I've been sleeping all night. This is Christmas Eve night. I mean, I've been working all day and on the way there, we were on the interstate and I woke up and I saw two beings standing in the roadway. And without opening their mouth, they said, you just let things happen the way that they're going to happen. And with that, I went back to sleep. And when I was awakened, I woke up with the tire blowing out. It was a loud boom, you know, like pop, where a tire would blow out. Mm -hmm. And so we pulled over on the side of the road, and the tire had a hole in it. Now, I just checked the, the, the um, now I want you to pay attention to everything that's taking place now. I had already checked the spare tire, and it was full of air. But when I went to check it that time, it, it was flat. So, now the Lord spoke to me through those individuals in that road. Saying you let things, everything happen the way it's going to happen, you know. Now, my auntie, you know, she have no idea about tires or the kind of pressure. And so I found, she asked me to find the hole. So I found the hole. And so what did she do? She go in the store, buy some bubble gum. Yeah, y'all see where I'm going with it. And got us all chewing the gum. <laughs> now, of course, I'm a man. I know good and doggone well. A tire won't fix any kind of, a bubble gum won't fix any kind of flat tire. But, you know, again, the only thing I'm thinking about is these two individuals that I saw on the road. You just let things happen the way they're going to happen. Now, other than that, we'd have been arguing. I'd have been just trying to get another ride. And just, you know, we don't have any flat tire. We don't have any spare tires, you know. So I go along with, okay, chewing the gum there, putting it on the tire, just like she said. Now, of course, I'm not silly. I'm not, you know, I know that gum won't fix a flat tire. So that didn't work, of course. Mm -hmm. So driving down, you know, the road, she asked me to drive, not that the tire's flat. And so driving down the road, you know, now normally I wouldn't have done that either. No, we just need to park it until we get a spare tire from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I'm driving. Now you keep in mind, in the military, I had a top secret security clearance. I was what you call the operations specialist. And uh, I sat behind radars and computers. In fact, the, the, the uh, radar that I sat behind uh, it, basically, it was also a remote control for jets. In World War II, 
we had pilots fighting in that war, and many of them would lose consciousness, and, and they would, and they jet would crash, killing them. And so then the military, the Navy came up with this idea, let's, let's create a console that can fly these jets remotely, just in case this happens. And so this was the console I was sitting behind. I was in the intelligence department of the Navy, you see. So I had a top secret security clearance. And so here I am, a loose cannon, riding all over the place. The military don't know where I am. So you know they got a warrant out for my arrest. You know, well, they don't know if I'm selling secrets to the Russians or not. They just know, you know, I'm some little 18 or 19 year old kid that's, that's out, you know, and about. Not checking in with them. And so uh, I'm riding down uh, I-10 in Louisiana. And lo and behold, we get pulled over. And that's not a big surprise. Again, I'm just thinking about what I saw and what I heard. You let things happen the way they're going to happen. Why? Because other than that, I'd have argued her down about the gum, and I'd have argued her down about driving, you know, on an interstate with a flat tire going 10 miles an hour. So I just let things happen the way they happen. So we got pulled over by this guy, this, this cop, and uh, he asked for my license, and I gave him my license. And, you know, I'm sure I know that I have a warrant out for my arrest. I, I know that, you see. And so you know, my auntie, she's cussing the man out, you know, not happy about it. You know, I, you know, of course, cause she don't have any insurance. Tag expired, all, you know, everything that, you know, like they say, she riding dirty, as dirty <laughs> as they can come. <laughs> You know, and I'm just being calm, you know. Now, other than I'd have been right along with her in the state that I was in at the time. But again, I saw those two beings standing in that street and they told me what to do. You just let things happen the way they're going to happen. And so the cop, he goes run my license and he comes back and he says, I see what you got on your name. In other words, I see that warrant that you have. But because you you are the way that you are. I'm going to let you go spend Christmas with your family, you see. And, but he wrote my auntie all kind of tickets <laughs> <laughs> that she might not have gotten if, if she had just kept her mouth shut, you see. <laughs> so be nice, you know, that's a lesson. Be nice, you know. <laughs> and so I, I go and spend Christmas at my aunt. I had to go to work the next day. And so I caught a ride back with another auntie of mine. And I'm told that maybe an hour or so after I left there, that the SWAT team just swarmed in on my auntie's house. You see? Why? Because, I, again, I'm a loose cannon. I got this top secret security clearance. I know all of this stuff about Navy intelligence. I could be out selling to the Russians. Mm -hmm. And so they come in with their guns and their full body armor and all of that looking for me because they sure I'm there, you see. They just know that I'm there because they could see that from, you know, the, where the warrant was pulled up from the night before. And, but except I wasn't. They, look, they just know that my family have hid me. And, and so one of them, to try to scare them, uh, my family members, they say, well, just shoot them on sight, you know. And my uncle, one of my uncles who was there, uh, he said, no, you can't do that, you know, because he was an officer in the military himself. He said, no, you can't do that. And so they looked like fools. Because they swarmed in and they thought they were going to get this big, big capture, except they didn't. I'm going to tell you why. Because it wasn't God's will that I get taken there. And so a couple of days after that, uh, my uncle, that one of the, the officer and my other uncle, uh, um, they took me down to the military base in New Orleans, to the naval base there in New Orleans. And on the way there, I'm praying, okay, God. I've submitted myself to you. I know that I've made a lot of bad decisions. And, you know, I, I know that this isn't going to be easy, what I'm about to go through. I said, but it sure would do me good if, if some kind of way you would give me a sign that this is all of you. And so I get to the military base and I'm checking in to that base. And the guy that's, that's checking me in, he has the same last name that I have. And so, uh, to make a long story short, we begin to converse and find out that we're relatives. Mm -hmm. And so he said, "Well, cuz I'm, I'm gonna do you, I'm gonna do you right. I'm just gonna give you a ticket and, and let you fly back to San Diego, you see, and, and let you turn yourself in there." And so that's what he does. He give me a plane ticket, you know, from, through the military, of course, and 
give me the keys to the barracks, to the room that I'm going to be staying in. And so the next morning when I go in and check in with the officer on duty, uh, he said, well, uh, Mr. Bolin, I got some bad news for you. Say that you, you have a warrant out for your arrest, so we can't just let you get on a plane. We're told to arrest you on site. And he, there he was trying to comfort me. I, I'm sorry that I have to die. Man, you just do your, do your job. It don't, you know, because I'm very sure now this is all a part of God's plan. Why? Because if it wasn't, I would have got arrested there in Lake Charles where I got pulled over the first time. I wouldn't have saw those two beings standing in the road there telling me what they told me. So I'm just following what they're saying. You just let things happen the way they're going to happen. Now, I do have in my mind, this is 1994. And this is, this is the year that New Orleans was the murder capital of the world. And now I'm about to go and be among these people. You see? And so I, I, get, I, I get handcuffed. I get taken to the Orleans Paris prison. And, and as I'm check, being checked in there, uh, the, the officer who was checking me in, I asked him, I said, can you put me uh, uh, where other Christians are? Now, on, on December 27, let me just back up. The day before then, uh, some, I was eating dinner on that base, on, on the naval base there in New Orleans. And somebody came and sat at my table and, uh, and uh, I began to pray with them because they were sharing what kind of problems they were having. So I began to pray with them. And they, and they uh, uh, asked me who I was, and I told them, I said, I'm a minister of the Lord. And from that day, that's who I was. I was a preacher of the Lord, you see. It, it, was, it was something that I had been pushed into, if that make any sense. In other words, Lord, nothing else have worked that I have tried. And so here I am now, a minister of the Lord, you see, at the age of 20. I begin to say that. I'm a minister of the Lord. And from that day, God began to use me. As his preacher, I had to speak it first. Everybody understand. And, and I had to accept that it was what I had to do. I had to disregard my past. OK, I, I, I didn't have this long middle of the road or this wide middle of the road. I went from cussing and fighting one day to being a preacher the next. You see that now with other people, it might happen differently. I can only tell you the way it happened with me. And I had some folks. And, and some relatives who had a problem with that. Well, you know, you got to get saved first. Well, when I submitted my life to the Lord, I was saved, you see. Amen. Well, now you got to go to, you got to be saved for so many years. And now God ain't said that. God told me to preach when I was 12 and I'm already behind. Amen. You see. No, God didn't have me go through some boot camp process. Life was my boot camp. My disobedience pushed me into what he was supposed, what I was supposed to have been doing, you see. And so I'm already behind. I'm eight years behind already. I need to get started, you see. And so I, I wouldn't have done that if the Lord hadn't told me. And so I'm, I'm in there now, in this, in this prison. And uh, the man, uh, I asked him, I said, could you put me where uh, you have Christians residing? You know, I'm thinking this is the murder capital of the world this time. And uh, I don't really know. If I want to be around murderers, because I'd hate to have to choke somebody or them choke me. You know, I'm just getting started in ministry. I don't want to become that type of person that is going to take to survive here. So I asked if you could put me around other Christians. And the man looked at me with this devious look and he said, we're going to put you wherever we have room to put you. I said, OK. And so I prayed the prayer when I was being led to my dorm, to my, you know, where they where they keep everybody. I said, Lord, mark everybody that belonged to you some kind of way. And so when I walked in there, everybody that belonged to the Lord had a cross on. Amen. And so I, when I walked in there, I walked upstairs to my cell where my cell was and put my things down in there. And uh, uh, I just began to pray and read the Bible. And I went out, stood over the, the, the balcony, the banister, I guess, and looked out. I guess it was about... Maybe 70 to 80 people in that one particular uh, 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 dorm there. And, uh, and as I'm looking out, the Lord spoke to me and said, before you leave here, all of these people are going to be sitting at your feet listening to the word. You see? And so it, it started with me and, and a brother that they call Happy. I still don't know what his name is. They just called him Brother Happy because that was the kind of person he was, Happy. 
uh, now let me just say this. He was happy until the word caught him. I put it that way. Why? Because next door to the, to the thing that we were in was the women prison part of it. And so uh, the, these girls, they would come out and they would be playing basketball there in the courtyard. And you had men lining up at the window getting phone numbers and, and addresses, you know, to, to hook up with these, these girls. And so I knew that Brother Happy was married because he had me praying, had me praying for his marriage. But I see him standing at the window trading addresses with a woman. And so I pulled him over to the side. I said, Brother Happy, would you want a man coming on to your wife? Uh, you know, or would you want your wife doing that? No, I said, well, you reap what you sow, brother. You can't, if you living for the Lord, you have to live for him. You can't be chasing women like that, Amen. you see. Well, from that point on, he became my enemy. He didn't have anything else to do with me. And so I just kept doing what I was doing, just reading and studying the word. And then another brother by the name of Damon Causey came up to me. Damon Causey, uh, I don't know if any of you remember, when those officers in New Orleans were arrested uh, for uh, dealing drugs and, and things like that. And the head officer who was over that little ring had this other girl killed. Well, he was caught up in all of that mess, you see. And so uh, he and I began to talk concerning the word. And I said, well, why don't you ask, um, why don't you ask the, the guard to let you come down to my cell? We can share the same cell. That way we can study and pray all night if we choose to. And he said, man, that guard don't like me. He said, he's not, that, that guard don't like me. He's not going to let me come down. I said, look, if it's God's will, it'll happen. He'll move people and change their hearts if something is will. Is, and so that's what he did. He put in the paperwork to be moved and that same guard approved it. You see? And so things begin to happen. We begin to pray and we begin to have Bible study. First, it was just me and him. And then it was just two people, you know, two more people and then more people. And then before you know it, everybody's gathered around the cell, sitting, sitting down, listening to the word. And so this began to alarm the prison guards because they're wondering, why is everybody gathered around this one cell? Is it a fight going on? What's going on? And so they came to see what was going on, and they saw me standing there teaching the Bible. And so what happened? Now the prison guards are coming to Bible study. You see that? I see three men in there that look just alike to me, look like they could all be twins or triplets, I guess. And so, but they're not talking to one another at all. One of them standing over here, one of them standing over there, the other one over here. And so I asked Brother Carlsey, what? These three, they look alike. He said, yeah, they're brothers. Oh, why are they not talking to each other? He said, because one of them got arrested for drugs. And then the other two got arrested. And basically, the cops played this game between them. Y you know, your brother's going to turn you in if you don't tell. So you better, if you want to get a deal on your case, you mean to turn them in. Now, neither one of them had snitched on each other, but all three of them thought that they had. You see? And so I began to talk to him. Look, y'all are brothers. Y'all got the same blood running through your veins. Y'all need to squash this because when it's all said and done, you're still going to be brothers, you see? And so the Lord used us to bring them back together uh, through his word. To make a long story short, I was in that prison for three weeks. Now, I was told that, that they would come and get me the next day, you know, because I was only there to be held until the Navy showed up. To, to fly me back to San Diego, except, you know, one day turned into two, two days turned into three, and next thing you know, it's three days there. I, I'm there for three weeks, you see. Now, <clears throat> this is over the Christmas holidays that I'm, that I'm in there. And so, one of the security guards who was coming to the Bible studies, and you keep in mind, they would work for 12 hours and then come sit for an hour listening to Bible study, you see. And so, one of the security guards, uh, he said, well, uh, Mr. Bowling, do you want me to call the, the, uh, your commanding officer to tell him that you're still here? I said, no. When, when, when it's time for me to leave, the Lord will remind her. Well, until then, I'll just be here. He, in his mind, you know, you didn't do anything major. You didn't kill anybody. The only thing you did was left the military. So you don't have any business around killers and stuff. But in my mind, well, this is where God wants me to be. These people need to be saved just like anybody else. And so I'll just stay right here. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I saw hardened people. 
as hard as they come. Folks, I, I taught Bible study to one man who had killed his mama, cutting her with a machete. Get saved. What was his problem? He was on drugs. You see, I saw folks in there that had done some terrible things that society had turned their backs on that would have just gave up. Well, you done killed somebody. You done sold drugs. Ain't no use to you anymore. But I saw the word of God change their lives. And that let me know the power of God's word and what it will do in an individual's life. You see, yeah. now in all of that, after, you know, through ministering to people in there, uh, I would get discouraged sometimes, uh, you know, thinking, I'd never been to prison before. I don't know what the outcome is going to be, what's going to happen, if I'm going to ever see the light of day again. And so I began to pray. You see? And, and Brother Kazi, of course, who's now sharing a cell with me, I'm on the top bunk and he's on the bottom. Uh, he and I were praying together and, uh, and things like that. And one night I'm up studying, reading the book of Ezekiel. He's laying on the bottom bunk. I hear noise down there, but I don't know what's going on. And when I look down there, I see him halfway out of the bed with his head underneath the cover, underneath the blanket, legs hanging out of the bed. And so I woke him up. I said, Brother Carter, what's going on? He said, I was trying to call your name. And I said, why was that? He said, because in my sleep, a spirit came up on the side of my bed and said, you're not going to get saved. You're not saved. And your big brother that's on the top bunk is not going to be able to help you. And he said that this spirit began to pull him by his feet out of the bed. And that's what I saw when I looked down there, him halfway out of the bed, you see. And so we were under demonic attack. Now, uh, so I, I just kept praying, you know, concerning my situation. I see people being saved and, and all of these things, but I still wanted to know what was going to happen to me. Lord, how, you know, the main thing I wanted to know was if God was with me, which I knew I was, but I wanted some confirmation. And so I woke up that morning and I asked God for a sign. Lord, give me a sign that you're with me in this place and that I'm going to walk out of here when you say so. That I'm not going to get caught up in this system and keep coming back or that I'm not going to get caught up in this system and get lost in it some kind of way. And so that night, of course, in those, those prisons, uh, the security guard, you know, that's behind the glass. They press one button and all of the cells close at one time. Except my cell didn't. And from the time, from that time until I left there, my cell never did close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they sent somebody in there to work on it, uh, but it didn't close. You see, and that was God, that was my sign from the Lord that I would walk out of there. That let me know no matter what kind of stuff man got set up, they, they're not going to over, override God's will, you see. Mm -hmm. And so before I left there, uh, Brother Kazi, uh, he told me, he said, uh, Brother Bolden, he said, you might not believe this. He said, but I prayed to the Lord for you. He said, I asked the Lord to send somebody here that would have Bible studies with me. You see, that's why I didn't get arrested in Lake Charles, because he had prayed me there. You see, and not only him, but to help other people there. And so he and I became the best of friends, you see. And so. I left there, finally in the military, uh, got in touch with the, with the base, you know, with, with, uh, with that particular prison, and uh, said, wait, we, we forgot, we got somebody that's there that we need to pull out of there and bring them over here, you see, to San Diego. And so I uh, left that prison in New Orleans on January 19th, 1995, you see. And I remember as I was leaving, I saw grown men lining up at the window there crying because they wanted the word to continue. And so I just exhorted them and told them, y'all just, you know, my time here is up. Y'all just continue in God's word. God is a personal God. He'll direct y'all. Just like he sent me here, it, it'll be other people that come here that'll study the word with you all. You know, I'm saying I saw killers and, and thieves and robbers and things like that crying, you know, uh, because they, they had made a brother in me, you know, that I was their brother, and they wanted the word. But, you know, uh, <clears throat> I believe that the word kept going forth there after I left. And I left somebody in my place to, to, to do the word, you know, to have Bible studies with them. And so on January 19th, I left there and was flown uh, to California, to San Diego. 
and uh, was put, put in the brig or naval prison there, you see. And so as I'm going up to my top tier, there as I'm going up the tier, you know, to, to my cell, uh, after I've been shown my cell, um, as I'm walking up the steps, I look down, of course, it's made up just like the other prison was. It's got several people in the same tier, but different cells, and everybody have their own cell, pretty much. I, I saw a man there, uh, down there, and the Lord spoke and said, he's one of mine. Go talk to him. Now, I didn't have my uniform with me, and so when I got there, I had to choose a uniform. I had to choose clothes, you know, uniform that could fit me, and shoes as well, you know, because you're still in the Navy, so you have to dress like you're in the Navy. And so I, I, I chose my uniform and I saw these real shiny shoes that I liked that somebody had polished up real nice. So I picked those. And so when I'm walking up these steps and the Lord speak to me and say, that's one of mine there. You go talk to him. I wouldn't put my clothes, my, my things up in my cell. Then I walked downstairs and I began to talk to him and we began to talk about the Lord. And in the middle of that, I just all of a sudden he bust out crying. And so I don't know what's going on. So I asked him, what's going on? He said, those shoes, those shoes. And I said, what about them? Well, his job was whenever people left the brig, he would help them to check out and would help to process them out. And whenever you left, you had to leave your uniform behind. You couldn't bring your uniforms with you, you see. And so this guy had left these shoes. Now, he's helping this guy check, check, you know, check out and, and get processed out. And he said when he looked down at the man, all of a sudden, he saw this man raise these shoes up in the air like this, and he held them up for about 10 to 20 seconds, just for no particular reason. And then he set them down. And so those same shoes being on my feet, it was a sign to him that I was sitting there to minister the word of the Lord. Just what the Bible says, how beautiful are the feet of those who, who run to preach the gospel, you see. So I'm in there. In my mind, I've already preached the word in New Orleans. I don't know what God has for me. I'm just going to study the word. I'm just going to remain incognito. I don't want to be known. I don't want to talk to anybody. You know, really, I don't want to. I'm not concerned with joining up with the fellowship here. I'm just study the word. So one night, and I, when I was in New Orleans, in the prison there, the Lord told me three different things, just out of the blue, three different things. And I wondered why, you see. Didn't know why. He told me those three things and he said, you hold on to them. And so I, uh, w when I'm in San Diego, or in, in California, in the brig there, uh, somebody invited me to go to Bible study there, you know, where the, the chaplain was teaching. And so I'm not interested in going. I said, no, I don't, I don't think I'll go. I think I'll just go ahead and keep, keep, reading the, keep reading the word. And then the Lord spoke and said, no, you go ahead and go. You go ahead and go to this Bible study. So I went on ahead and went. And at the end of every Bible study, I was told this, the chaplain, he would let people ask questions. And so what did he do? Uh, three people asked questions that he couldn't answer. And the, the answer to those questions were the three things that the Lord had gave me when I was in New Orleans. And so I answered them. And so after Bible study was over, I went up to him and I apologized. I said, I didn't mean to, to do that. I said, uh, it's just the strange thing, the way that it happened. He said, he just patted me on the back and he said, no, that's okay. I didn't know the answers. Apparently, the Lord gave you the answers. I didn't think anything about that, you know, from that point on until the next Sunday I was sitting in church, which was my first time going to that particular church there on the base. And he came up behind me and, and put his arm around me and to, to whisper in my ear. And uh, he said, how long have you been a preacher? I mean, no, he asked me, how many, pa how many churches have you pastored? Now, he's asking me that, and I'm in prison, you see. I said, none. I'm only, I'm only 20 years old. And he said, well, you come by my office. We're going to schedule you to preach. And that's how I began to preach there. I never, from, from, from the time I began to preach until now, I never had to announce that I was a preacher wherever I went. The Lord would just open up doors some kind of way, you see. And so I went by his office and he scheduled me to preach. And as I began to preach, people began to come, you see. Now this, I'm a prisoner, but people began to come. And not only those people, it had other churches that heard about what I was preaching. They began to come 
to that particular church. Would just shut, whenever I would preach, they would shut down their own church and come to the church where I was preaching at, you see. And so that is how the Lord moved in my life. That is how I was pushed into the ministry. And now let me tell you, it wasn't comfortable, you, you see. It wasn't comfortable. But just like this word says, all things work for the good of those, you see, who are called according to his purpose. You see that? No, I, if, if you let me go back and replay all of that or let me live it all over again, I'll start preaching when I'm 12. Amen. But see, all of this was designed to be a testimony from the Lord. All of it was designed by God. You see, and, and although it was uncomfortable, I think about the many people whose lives were touched while I was while I was in there, while I was in prison, uh, whose lives were changed. And what it did, it gave me a heart for people, people who have been in prison. You see, it, it gave me a heart for people. It, it let me know. I'm going to tell you something. Some of the strongest people I've met in, in, in this Christian walk are people who have been behind bars. You see. Uh, when you're in jail, when you're in prison, uh, they turn out the lights for you. They tell you when to go to bed. You can't go to the refrigerator and, and just get something out of the refrigerator for you to eat. Mm -hmm. They tell you when to eat. They tell you when to wake up. They control just about every aspect of your life. They'll even control who you can communicate with. You see? They control all of that. And so... As the Lord began to reveal to me that I was in a deliverance ministry, that he had given me a ministry of deliverance. In other words, praying for people who were held captive. I, I, I knew firsthand what it was to be bound. I understood that when people are bound by the devil, he tell them when they're going to eat and drink. Amen. He controls different aspects of their life. They don't have any control of that. And so, and so what it did was it helped me to understand that when people are bound by the devil, that they are truly bound, that they need to be set free the same way I was set free naturally from prison. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. <clears throat> I was released on the 27th of May of, of 1995. I got out a month early for, for good behavior. And I remember when I was taken to the airport uh, to fly home, I remember thinking, man, is this a joke? This is too good to be true. You mean to tell me I can go out now and, and buy some McDonald's or buy, you know, it was just a whole different experience to be able to go where I wanted to go <clears throat> and do what I want to do. <clears throat> and because of freedom now, I'm free. I don't have some, somebody else telling me what to do and when I can do it. It was a freedom that I had experienced. And, and listen, God wants us to experience that same kind of freedom, spiritually speaking. You see, he wants us to know where the spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. Well, we're, we're, we're free now. If we can have church on Wednesday night at midnight if we want to. Amen. You see that? We can wake up whenever we feel like it and pray. We're, we don't have to be bound by religion. And we don't have to be bound by any of these things that the devil got out uh, for us to be bound by. That there is, if there is freedom in God. That, that we are free to pray to him when we want. We are free to eat this word whenever we want to eat it. We are not bound. You see, God wants us to understand that. And so that was my calling. That was how I was pushed into the ministry. It, it wasn't something that, you know, just one day I just had a good idea that I would preach. No, <laughs> it was God pushing me into my destiny. And let me say something. Uh, uh, for some of some of you who may be listening in or some of you who may be watching, uh, when God have called you to do something, you're going to do it. Now, you can either do it his way, which is the easier way, or you can make your life harder on yourself and, 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 and still do it. You see, Jonah, uh, he could have bought it that well. You see, all he had to do was go and, 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 and do what God told him to do. But he decided to take a detour. And God said, okay. Now, let me say something else, what God revealed to me. Uh, when I was in prison, I saw many people, good, good people, who I thought, you know what? Yeah, they may have killed somebody. Or they may have robbed somebody. 
But the Lord have changed their lives. And if you let them out today, they'll never come back here again. It's got people who don't get converted by the Lord. They, they can go, go to prison and be sentenced for 20 years, get out and do the same thing. And then you got people who God touch who go in there and when they're done, they're done. They don't go back in. They don't get in any more trouble. Why? Because it's only in Jesus Christ where true correction goes. You see, they call it the Department of Correction. Well, how all they're doing is just putting, just stacking people in there. Nobody's being corrected. Only God can bring, bring reform in a person's life. You see that? And so I saw firsthand how, you know, how it had good people in there. Good, good people. Now, everybody in there is not an animal. You know, God have died for everybody. You see? Now, and the truth be told, most of us have done something that we could go to jail for. We just hadn't got caught. You see that? And as soon as we get big-headed and think we're more than somebody that's in prison, God will remind us, look, you cheated on your taxes. You know what folks are getting for that now? You see that? <laughs> so I saw good people. And I began to ask the Lord, Lord, there's a lot of good people in here. Why? And he spoke and let me know. Uh, and these words uh, is the belly of the whale. In other words, I have callings on their lives. And I'm preserving their life. Because if I had let them stay out, they'd have got shot and killed. Think about it. Many people, when they read that story in the book of Jonah, they look at that well as being a curse when it was really a blessing. How so? Because if God would have let Jonah stay out there in that water, he'd have drowned. He couldn't swallow up all that water. That well was sent to him to preserve his life. He didn't have to worry about treading water when he was in the belly of that well. You see, he didn't have to worry about swim, swimming back to shore somewhere. Listen, when that belly, when, when, when it was time, when he finally yielded his life to God, God had that well spit him right back out on dry land. Amen. On dry land. That well wasn't there and didn't spit him out in the middle of the ocean somewhere and say, okay, you make your way back to the dry land as, as, as best as you can. That well was set there. What does it represent? God's protection. Even when we don't understand it, God protects us. You see, so my prayers is that uh, somebody was blessed by this message that that, you know, all things do work together for the good. You see, but what, what good is it? It is for God's purpose. Let's submit to God's purpose and, 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 and we'll see God's miracle and his power working in our lives. Amen. Amen.